We are looking at the triumphal entry, and um, I'm going to try to, with words, paint the scene for you and to give you an indication of the scripture of what it meant. Uh, a frequent subject of uh, religious paintings and uh, shows here all the various uh, attitudes and points being made. Some of these uh, dark faces in the, in the crowd are not happy about this, but the children are very happy and others are spreading cloth and garment before the coming king. Let me ask you to travel this scene with me and let's bow in silent prayer and just ask the Lord to bring his message into your heart today. All right, triumphal entry. And we'll be looking at John chapter 12, some other verses as well. John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. I didn't want to put it all out here for us to read the beginning. We'll be reading it as we go through. Uh, John for us uh, sets the scene in verses 12 and 13. Those verses say, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna. We'll try to get into that and get an understanding of that. And they said, Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. To understand this scene, we need to understand that the people came with expectation. They heard Christ was coming. They came with certain expectation. We understand this because they were quoting from a psalm that was very important. Psalm 118, 25 and 26. It starts out by save now. I've bolded that to remind you of something in a moment. I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord be the temple. Hosanna is the Hebrew for save now. <laughs> save now. Save us now. That's what Hosanna is. Understand politically that Israel at this time was under the control of Rome. The entire civilized world was under the control of Rome. When we say Rome, we're talking about the Roman Empire, but we're talking about the city of Rome. Uh, that, was, that was the place. That was the place of the king. That was the ruling city. Now, at Passover, all Israel gathered in Jerusalem. It was the rule, it was the law that every man of Israel had to leave wherever he lived, across the seas, wherever, and come to Jerusalem at Pentecost. So it was a huge, huge crowd. Uh, Jerusalem stayed crowded. Then uh, you had uh, military people there from Rome, and uh, so that crowded it up even more. Then Pentecost came, and thousands upon thousands of Jews from around the world came wearing their, uh, uh, you know, strange garments and coming with uh, backpacks and, and pack mules and all these things and uh, brought it in. So all the uh, Hotel Sixes were filled. All of the Airbnb were filled. Anybody that you knew uh, could put you up. You were you were bunked on an air mattress on the, the floor of their living room. So Israel gathered together. It was a time of national feeling. We are back in Jerusalem, however far we have uh, wandered, where life has taken us. When 
the sense of independence was ready to flare up, uh, ready to burst into fire if we could rule ourselves, you see, as one time we did. Now, in this case, the spark was Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. A prophet was going to be there who was not just a guy who talked a lot. He was a guy who healed people of everything. The incurable leprosy, he healed them. People who were born blind, whose eyes had never seen, were healed. People that were born from birth lame sprung up. They didn't ever have to learn to walk. Immediately, they got up and could walk. Those legs that were, how, how thin, spindly were those legs that had never walked, always been carried wherever they'd been. And now those legs could support them. And they would leap and, and say, hallelujah, lepers, the, the running sores were cleansed. The skin was pink instead of dead white. And a man that had been dead and buried in a sepulcher for three days walked out of there alive and well. This said to them, here was the promised Messiah, the Christ. He has come. How excited were they? How excited were they for Israel? The people made the meaning of their demonstration plain with palm branches, the way you receive kings, signs of victory, signs of rejoicing, with the quote. Notice that in the psalm, he that cometh in the name of Jehovah would normally refer to the worshiper drawing near to the temple. These psalms were psalms that were sung and chanted as they went to the temple at uh, Passover or other times they were there. But now the people changed that to say, blessed is the king of Israel. Oh, the king. King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. This was their expectation. This was the scene. This was that volatile scene. Perhaps this was the time to overthrow Rome. This was the time to proclaim a new king. And who better than a miracle worker like this Jesus. Now, let me step back in a time to talk about the prophecies. The timing of this day was given to us, to Israel, in Daniel 9, 24 and 25. Now, this takes a great deal of study and reasoning and get into it. So I'm summarizing this, of course, because we only have, what, four or five hours since morning. So, no. Seventy weeks, an angel said to Daniel, are determined upon thy people, Israel, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, you see, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is talking about the coming of the new covenant which was the only covenant that God presented to them that could forgive sins. The old covenant of the law would recognize sins, would identify sins, but did not forgive sins. He goes on to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. To anoint was to pour oil upon for the sake of anointing a king or a prophet or a priest. In the case of the Messiah, he was to be all three. Verse 25, Know therefore, the angel says, and understand, and he gives him a timing sequence, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. This happened in their past uh, when Nehemiah, but it was still future to Daniel. He was in uh, Babylon. To restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that happened when Nehemiah was sent forth to rebuild the wall. You did, not have, you did not rebuild a city until you built the wall around it. 
that showed its independence, that showed its ability to defend itself. And so this was the time when that happened, this clock began to tick and was counting off God's time of this prophecy. And that's the start. The terminus of this prophecy was unto Messiah, the prince. Prince is not technically the son of a king, uh, though it could be, but it just is the simple word for ruler. Prince in the sense of principal person. He says that the time between when Israel, when Jerusalem would be restored until Messiah the Prince would be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, seven weeks is seven, three score is 60 plus two. 62 and 7 is 69 weeks. He's going to mention another week, so a total of 70 weeks. But the word used for weeks here is the word seven. So 77s will, are determined upon thy people. And then there will be seven sevens, and then a stretch of three score and two, 62 sevens. A little bit later in Daniel, he's talking about fasting. And uh, there, there's some things, it's like a, the duh factor, you know, where you explain something that, well, duh, of course. But in that, he says, I, um, I was uh, fasting certain weeks of days. <laughs> He adds in seven of days, he was not, not years like I was talking about before, like the angel was talking about before. This is actually speaking of seven years. Seven says seven years. Now, the prophecy makes literal sense. A book was written, The Coming Prince, by Robert Anderson, a very uh, careful scholar, a man who presented this and people you know, sat back on their seats and said, amazing. Uh, you can get a hold of it today and, and read through it. He was writing in the, uh, from the middle of the 1800s to the 1900s. It was a breakthrough study of this passage. And so instead of reading the entire book to you, I thought about that for about a second and I uh, said, no, but he argued this. No student of the gospel narrative can fail to see. Most of us had failed to see until he wrote this. But he says, no, no student can fail to see that the Lord's last visit to Jerusalem, and he's talking about the triumphal entry, was not only in fact, but in purpose of it, the crisis, this is the, the turning point of his ministry, the goal toward which it had been directed, he entered Jerusalem as recorded in the Gospels. What then was the length of the period intervening between the issuing of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem and the public advent, public coming of Messiah the Prince? He says it was from 14th March B.C. 445 to 6th of April A.D. 32. What was the length of time. He answers, the interval contains exactly and to the very day 173,880 days or 70 times 69 prophetic years of 360 days. The first 69 weeks of Gabriel's, the angel Gabriel's prophecy. Now if that if he was too much for you. Let me just say he worked it out, and I don't know how he did that, passing from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar and make all those changes. We were just listening on the radio. The, uh, whose birthday was it? Bach. Bach. Bach's birthday was um, my wife's birthday, the 21st. And that's when he was born. But then later in his lifetime, they changed into the different calendar, and so it was then, what, March 30th or something? 31st. 31st. So. Ten days later. 
So the guy said, we're going to celebrate it on the 21st because if you ask him when we were born, he'd say March 21st. So, uh, but, but so many things changed. I, I just kind of shudder, my, my academic side shudders at imagining going through the studies of finding this out day by day by day and coming up with 173,880 uh, uh, days. But he did that. Now, would I go to the stake defending this? Probably not, because I didn't do this study myself. But it has to be close. It has to be close. I believe that it was this prophecy given to Daniel, one of the wise men of Babylon, that when the wise men of Persia, and Daniel lived into the time of Persia and was one of the wise men then, but many years later, three, three, why am I saying that? The wise men that came to visit uh, Jerusalem, that came to visit Jerusalem, because this prophecy was given to Daniel for his people and his holy city, that would be Israel and Jerusalem, they came to Jerusalem to ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And I think they knew it was going to be about that time, and that's when God gave them the miraculous sighting of that miraculous star. Anyway, I believe that uh, this gave the wise men the expectation of a coming king. They were studying the works of the earlier wise men and um, caused them to journey to Jerusalem after God showed them the supernatural star. So I think this was it. This was the prophecy. And so that God was looking forward to this time when he would present himself as king to Israel. He would offer himself as king if they would receive him for who he was, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. The idea here is that the Israel, if they had come to him and accepted, he could have begun the millennial kingdom then. It seems so odd to us. Um, and, of course, God knew they wouldn't, but the offer was real. And um, it was offered again after Christ's death and resurrection it was offered by the apostles to Israel again during the first part of the church. Uh, but then came, of course, the, uh, the attack on Israel, AD 70, and uh, the dispersion of Israel. And uh, now the kingdom will come as we know it in the future. So we see here, this was the timing of it. And then we see the character of it. How did the Old Testament describe this? Uh, John 12, 14 and 15, Jesus, when he had found a young ass, a young donkey, uh, ass is just the early English uh, for donkey, that was just what they called it, sat thereon as it is written. See, And so uh, John is saying he chose to do what was prophesied. It was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Now, examining the prophecy, what was, uh, when he says it was written, where was it written? What was written? Well, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Zion is the hill upon which Jerusalem is built. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just that is, according to law, having salvation, lowly, riding upon an ass, upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Uh, not on some great white horse, that will come later, but on, upon a, a, a humble donkey. So John emphasizes the last part, come your king sitting on an ass's colt, to show the visible part of Christ's fulfillment. And so Christ came on the donkey's colt. 
then examining Christ's actions. Christ was publicly claiming messianic honor. You may understand me to be the Messiah. That was his proclamation on this day. Now, this action did not happen before. This was the day. I think this was the, the fulfillment of that great prophecy by Gabriel to Daniel, uh, perhaps to that very day. I want you to consider the dramatic contrast with Christ's past conduct up until this time. He repeatedly asked those to whom he ministered to tell no one. This was the stuff that the story of Messiah was, was you know, bound to, to bring forth. He said, don't, don't, don't tell. Matthew 16, 20. Then he charged, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Jesus, his human name, Christ, his title of king, Messiah. Mark 5, 43. He charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that he should be given her, Jairus' daughter, something to eat. Um, don't get it out that I've, I've raised this child from the dead. See. John 6, 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, Pastor Emiro's message today, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. He avoided being uh, coerced to be king. But this was the time. This was when it was, should have been done. This is when he said, now I proclaim myself king. So the action had not happened before. And in fact, Christ organized this triumphal entry. Now this is something that I had missed until I got into this study and others had picked it up. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the passages that people have misunderstood, thinking that he's talking about his second coming, um, is, is in here, and we'll get to that. Jesus had planned for this joyful reception. He had sent his disciples throughout the cities to proclaim that the Messiah was coming. He was organizing this, you see. In Matthew 10, 23, he said this, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. Don't spend a lot of time battling it out in one city. Just go to another. For verily I say to you, time is limited, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. This is not the second coming. This is him coming to Jerusalem. He sent them to the cities that he would visit on his route to Jerusalem for the triumphal entry. He sent them as, what's the term, the, the forward men, you know, the promoter people, to say the Messiah is coming. He's coming through your city. He's going to be proclaiming himself as Messiah. Don't tell people I'm the Messiah. Now he says, go through and tell them this. And so this was the publicity path. He sent his disciples to Bethphage to get the donkey, setting it up for this, this situation. Luke 19, and as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, what do you think you're doing, dudes? <laughs> Why loose ye the colt? They said, the Lord hath need of him. Now Christ had told them that if somebody asks, to tell them that, so he had made arrangements ahead of time with this person. And Jesus knew that his time, this time, had come. In Luke 19, 39 and 40, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Do you hear what they're saying? They're quoting the Psalms about you. They're calling you, you come in the name of the Lord. You're coming as king. Rebuke them. He says, no. He answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones 
would immediately cry out. Well, that's been an odd thing. And the, uh, the stones start singing, Hosanna, save now. Here comes the king. In other words, the very creation felt the impulse of saying hallelujah to the king who is going to rule over the creation. He said, it has to happen now. I will not rebuke them. So, all of that brings us back to where we left off. And Christ is entering in. The people are seeing him. This is the guy? Yes, that's the guy. I want you to imagine the cheering that hailed him as Messiah the King. <laughs> Here was Israel's true king, David's son, prophesied to come, and Lord, Master, now officially presented himself to the nation. Here was his true offering of the kingdom to Israel by declaring himself the Messiah who should come. I am here. And so everything was in place to bring in the millennial kingdom if they had received their king. Well, let me take you to the third place to look at the reactions to this great triumphal entry. Verses 16 to 19. Notice the disciples, first of all, in verse 16. So all of this was going on. The disciples are cheering, yeah, yeah, yeah. But John confesses, these things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, when he had risen from the dead, men remembered that these things were written of him, that they had done these things unto him. He said, we uh, frankly didn't get it. It was bigger than we had imagined. We thought that this man that we had honored and asked what kind of a man is he, he could do miracles, he spoke for God, and should be king. Our hopes were at the top. But we didn't understand. John, one of the very disciples, admits the truth. They understood none of his plain references to death and resurrection. Their minds were so set on his immediate kingdom that only his resurrection could change it. So they were happy. They were cheering. They might have contributed a robe and put it on the path, have the, uh, the donkey walking on something a little softer than the cobbled stones. But let's look at somebody else. In that area, in that arena, there were witnesses of the raising of Lazarus. There was Lazarus and Mary and Martha, the family. They were fairly wealthy people from all that we can gather. I don't know that how wealthy wealthy is, but, um, but they, were, they were a wealthy family. And so they had a lot of friends. At three days after he had been buried, there was still... Uh, the mourning party, M-O-U-R, mourning party was uh, there and people weeping out loud and, and so on. And then Christ walked in. We see here in verse 17, the people therefore that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave. So I don't know how many, but there seems to be a large group. I would say what, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 50s, I don't know. Called out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. Bear record. Here are the eyewitnesses saying, that's the one I saw him call to the tomb and the man struggling with his grave clothes came walking out. And we were scared to death when they started taking it off. Is he going to be some zombie that we saw in the living dead? No. He was, well, spitting out a little linen from his mouth <laughs> and uh, doing, doing well, looking really good. He's the one who did it. 
This is the man who raised Lazarus, well-known Lazarus, from the dead. Here was the, in a week, many of the people in this group are going to be crying out, crucify him, crucify him, in a week. How deep is Israel's guilt for rejecting him when his credentials were so indisputable? The actual witnesses of him raising Lazarus from the dead. There was a secondary group there, point C, of the hearers of the raising of Lazarus. They're mentioned in verse 18. The people who were there and saw it had told others. Can't you imagine? How was the funeral? <laughs> He's alive. For this cause the people also met him, for they that heard that he had done this miracle. They said, we've we got to see this guy. We've got to see the man who raised Lazarus from the dead. And then there were the religious leaders, the Pharisees. Verse 19. The Pharisees, after having come to him and said, you should rebuke them, he says, no. They gathered off in a little corner. And they said, they said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world has gone after him. We were trying to get rid of him. Look what's happened. They were upset. The rulers were making a decision. They thought this excitement was dangerous, might look like insurrection might look like trying to rule and break the control of Rome dangerous for them and for Israel but they didn't want to be replaced not even by God John 11:57 now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he was, Jesus, he should show it that they might take him. Uh, he's skulking around here someplace. He's hiding. He's over here, over there, raising people from the dead. He's doing this, feeding 5,000 people. He's doing all this stuff. But it, you, 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 on threat of excommunication, you tell us where he is. We're going to arrest him. We're going to take him. Jesus said, you want to know where I am? Okay. He countered that commandment by sheer force of numbers. Boom, here am I. Here am I with everybody noticing. Here am I proclaiming myself to be king. The people would have overthrown the Jewish rulers if they tried to arrest him at this time. Are you men crazy? You see, this is the king. And so Palm Sunday remembers the day that Jesus proclaimed himself Messiah the king and offered the nation of Israel the opportunity to become the ruling nation of the entire planet. But their leadership, moved by jealousy and rigid unbelief, unbending unbelief. The Jewish leadership led the nation instead to crucify the prince of life. Well, this changed his method of presenting himself as king. Now, his rule as king of the earth will occur, but will it occur by blood and war? Jesus will come, not on a humble foal of a donkey, but on a white horse charging into battle. Revelation 19.11, John in this vision sees the end times. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. 
and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge, king was the final judge, and make war. Here he comes, not gently, but forcefully. Instead of treading on palm, tree, palm leaves and garments, he will trample on the violent wicked who are slaughtering his own brothers and sisters, the believers in the great tribulation. This is uh, a bloody invasion. Revelation 19, 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress. That's, that's where the grapes are put and stomped on, breaking them open so that their fluid runs out. He says he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. They're in the midst of killing all those who believe at that time until Christ comes and kills them. Instead of rejection by Israel, all Israel will believe they will be saved. We have this promise specifically, Romans 11:26, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. They will believe. They will become Christians. Revelation 1.7 Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Israel. And all kindred to the earth will wail because of him. Even so. Amen. And the glorified church, you and me, will sit at his side on his throne. He gave this promise when he's writing the letters to the churches. Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh, overcometh means who got saved, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. <laughs> The throne of the kingdom, the throne of the kingdom of earth, the throne that he takes because he's the son of King David. And we will be there with him. The triumphal entry, a thing well worth our study and our imitation of admiring our king. Let this be a day of rejoicing. Let's pray. Father, you've given to us an opportunity to look not only in the past at the triumphal entry, but a realization that the time is coming when we will be there at the coronation. We will there be as your family, as your children, as priests and kings before all the people. But all attention will not be upon us, but upon you, as you are glorified in the world. I pray, Father, you might help us to understand that there is much for us today to rejoice about. Are we in difficult times? Are we uh, surrounded by unbelief and by militant anti-Christian thought? Yes, but they are not the ones that actually have control. You have. And you are our king. Therefore, in the midst of trial, in the midst of testing, in the midst of the failure of that which is around us, we look to you for strength and we find Christ is the king. And we sing hallelujah. We say praise God. It is all in his hands, and his timing is his own. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be that you're thinking, I have not 
received Christ as my Savior. If he were to come today to take the Christians to heaven, I not, might not be going with them. So I don't know that in my heart, in my very heart, I have received Christ as my Savior. I have spoken his name. I have attended his church. I have sung hymns of him. But what has happened in my heart perhaps is not true, is not actually asking Christ as my Savior. If that is the troubling thought on this day of rejoicing, let me ask you to just slip your hand up, say, pray for me. May I turn to Christ as my Savior, as my King today. Would you slip your hand up, say, pray for me. I would love to pray for you. Bring your name before God. Our Father, then we turn to thee and thank you for the offer of salvation as you offered the kingdom to Israel so, then, uh, so long ago. We thank you for the offer that we may take as they could have taken, but they rejected and their city was destroyed. Father, if we were to reject your offer of salvation, we will be destroyed and that forever. But we thank you for the offer of salvation. And for each one here that knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that they've received Christ as personal Savior and that one day we will be with you when you return in wrath and in glory. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.